Welcome to the Devin Nunes Podcast. Breaking through the political noise, separating fact from fiction. From the San Joaquin Valley, the breadbasket of the solar system. Here is your host, Devin Nunes. I want to welcome you back to the Devin Nunes Podcast. This is another book review with a great journalist, a great investigative journalist who writes for American Greatness. Her name is Julie Kelly. She has written this book that comes out just in the next few days uh, called Disloyal Opposition. And I read the book, Julie, congratulations. You've been following the Russia hoax. You've been following what some of these naysayer, never Trump movement Republicans, I, I, I sometimes really question, were they ever Republicans at all? Or, or were they just grifters? And do they continue to be grifters? And now they've just changed their grifting from conservative causes to relying on left-wingers all over the country for their money so that they can put up the facade of that there's a lot of Republicans that are against President Trump and against what the Republicans are currently doing. So, Julie, congratulations. You followed this closely. Uh, just a little bit about your, your, well, look, I'll let you I'll let you talk about it. Tell us a little bit, you talk about it in your book a little bit, but tell us about your background, where you're from, how you got in, into journalism. So I am in suburban Chicago, which is where I was born and raised, and um, my background is in politics. So I worked for Republican candidates and office holders here in, uh, there used to be a Republican areas of Illinois. There are few and far between now. So that's really my background. I worked as a precinct committeeman. I did phone banks, volunteering for all kinds of campaigns, took 10 years off to be a stay-at-home mom, which I kind of am still, and then um, I started writing first about agricultural and food policy because I started teaching cooking classes out of my home. And then I went from covering food and ag policy, which you probably, I know you're interested in too. And that just mm -hmm. kind of pivoted into politics. So since Donald Trump was elected, I've been covering politics and writing exclusively for American Greatness, which uh, is our website. And we've been, uh, you know, covered you and what you've gone through the past three years, so uh, we followed it pretty closely. So, what year did you did you start with writing for American Greatness uh, during the campaign of 2016, or not until after the president was elected? It wasn't until the president was elected. I was still covering those issues I just named, also scientific issues like climate change, um, and then I was writing for National Review and the Federalist, uh, both of those publications. Which is interesting because, as you know in the book, um, I'm somewhat critical of National Review because they really did help launch the Against Trump, Never Trump movement. They've pivoted somewhat away from that since then. Um, but no, I didn't really start covering politics until after Donald Trump was elected. Well, well, we're lucky that you have started covering politics, Julie, because you've been one of the great people that's out there, and you're not afraid to call it like it is. and. You know, let's so let's just dive right into um, how did you you were following all these guys and I assume on reading them online, also following what they say on Twitter, uh, which, you know, Twitter is really just a sewer, uh, but everybody gets on there and they talk. So it's a great place to kind of follow what someone is saying, uh, what they're thinking about, who they're retweeting. It's, it's a good way to follow what they're doing. I assume you started to pick up. Uh, from some of these so-called never Trump, uh, the things that they were saying, what what kind of really got your interest at the you know at the very very beginning? Take us back to kind of early 2017 when you start to see, wait, you know something's going on here to the traditional Republican Party that I saw to these people that I've been reading forever. How did you decide to follow them and then decide to write this to write a book about them? Well, it really started with Bill Kristol, as I explain in the book. He was one of my political heroes. I mean, it basically was a neoconservative. Um, you know, the, that was, I was probably one of the first subscribers to the Weekly Standard. I followed him since he was Dan Quayle's chief of staff and really admired him. And so when I saw what he was doing to Donald Trump, really how he was fighting against him all the way up until Election Day, I saw so many of them. Uh, former Bush administration officials who decided to support Hillary Clinton. We're seeing that kind of repeat itself now in 2020. But it was really Bill Crystal. So I kind of look back, I wrote a piece for the Federalist that was a, kind of a fake breakup letter with Bill Crystal, And I went through all of the things that he'd been saying about Trump. 
But as I write in the book, it's not just Donald Trump that they've gone after. And I think that that is the most alarming thing about Never Trump is that they've also gone after his administration, the Republican Party, lawmakers like you who support the president, and the rank and file. And so they've really, it's not just Trump that they're criticizing. It's not just Trump's character, his behavior, his tweets. It's trickled all the way down to rank and file. These are the people who supported the Never Trumpers, right? So they're the people who subscribed to the magazines. They bought the books. They, uh, you know, volunteered and donated to their political campaigns. And they really turned on us in a nasty way. Well, and eventually uh, it, they crashed and burned, right? They ran out of money. And now they've popped up uh, and they seem to be really well financed. And so through your research, wh where do you think their money's coming from? Because I have not met a Republican or a conservative across the country that's giving money to, to to any of these movements. And clearly, this is part of a disinformation campaign that's coming directly from the DNC and the Biden campaign. Uh, so somebody affiliated with them has to be funding this, this broader movement. Uh, and, and in your research, do you have any leads uh, on possibly where some of this money is coming from? Now, I know, I know some of these people that, um, you know, they were, you know, kind of B-level uh, journalists in the past, uh, and they essentially just moved over to the, you know, the Washington Post and some of the, you know, some of the kind of the, the New York Times, some of those obvious locations. So that's essentially corporate money funding and giving them a job where their job is to just be this, the token Republican that just beats up on Republicans all day. I, I get that gig. But to start up these websites and to have this as much money as they have to start these movements of, you know, supposedly all the, the Bush people now that are against uh, Donald Trump, someone is funding that, somebody's making money off of this. Who Who is it, in your opinion? Well, that's a great way to put it. So first you talk about MSNBC, CNN, Washington Post, New York Times. So those are the ones that have hired, like you say, kind of B-level pundits, influencers who people really hadn't heard of before. So their shtick now is to be the anti-Trump conservative Republican, which they aren't anymore. But there's also a lot of left-wing cash that's going into these Never Trump nonprofits. And one of them is Pierre Omidyar, who is the founder of eBay. He is spending millions of dollars pouring into these Never Trump nonprofits, and you'll see them all over the place. So Bill Kristol was one. Defending Democracy Together has received millions of dollars from Omidyar's nonprofit. They, they kind of came after you. They were big defenders of the Mueller probe. Um, and now they're going after other Republican senators and the president. But this is where the money's coming from, not the right, the left. Yeah, and I think that's and I think that's a key because this is essentially their these are avatars that are being put out there in the campaign to say, look, even Republicans are against are against Trump. The reality is, you know, Republicans and conservatives vote with their pocketbook. And if people aren't writing checks against the president, then there truly are not Republicans that are that are against this president. You know, and I, I always take people back to that. You know, I stayed out of the primaries despite what the the crazy left wing media and mainstream media continue to say that I was like some involved in in the Trump campaign. I actually wasn't. As chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, I stayed out because I thought it was appropriate for the Republican Party to stay out of the primaries. And what I said from the from the very beginning is, look, whoever the nominee is, and at that time we had I don't know 15 candidates running. Uh, all of them had great resumes, by the way. We had really good candidates. And for Donald Trump to come out on that, and I think myself included, I don't think any of us really thought that that Donald Trump was going to win. But he had a loyal fan base. He's obviously a very effective communicator. And he shocked the entire Republican Party. The strange thing about this is, is that once I was, uh, you know, once after the convention, I endorsed uh, Donald Trump uh, and started to do campaigns, uh, you know, campaign events for him. And I noticed there were very few Republicans who were going to do events. And I think when I look back at that, it was because you had these Republican pundits that were out there who were essentially, oh, he's never going to win. He's never going to win. He's never going to win. Eventually, you say that uh, lie long enough. And then I think kind of your average Republican elected official out there was like, well, I'm just going to kick back and not do anything, which I always thought was a joke. Because look, even if if Donald Trump was to, even if he wasn't to win back in 2016, he's still our standard bearer. He brought new people to the party. 
Uh, and look, we went through that with Romney. I mean, I, I, I laugh like, you know, Romney had a total transformation. And I don't want to make this beating up on Romney's session here or Pierre Delecto, as he likes to call himself uh, on Twitter. But, you know, he was he was a liberal Republican from Massachusetts. Hey, that's fine. Great. I, I get it. You've got to do that to survive in politics. But then he totally changed and he became like Mr. Right Winger. But, you know, all along, I think that 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 all was a all was a facade. But, you know, every campaign has these these, you know, every candidate, you know, I think has to figure out how they're going to communicate to the to the American people. So I just thought it was a, a little odd that, you know, hey, Donald Trump may be your, not our average, you know, kind of Joe Republican candidate. But look, neither was Mitt Romney. Neither, neither was John McCain, for that matter. You know, they both got smoked and clobbered. They were called racist. I mean, all the same things that they did against Donald Trump. The only difference was is that they didn't actually turn our nation's intelligence you know, agencies against the Republican Party, against the Trump campaign. And that's really what happened in 2016, which astonishes me why people don't understand that you may not like Donald Trump. He, not, he may not be your type of Republican. But to go against and not see the larger picture when you had the Clinton campaign fund this, fund this operation in 16 and the DNC and corrupt our intelligence agencies, is it's unfathomable. In fact, that's why this movement is so crazy. And you go back and look back, and I know, I think, I know Lee Smith wrote about it in his book and the plot against the president. I know you you talk about it a little bit too. You really can trace some of this never Trump movement. They were taking this disinformation from the Clinton campaign, the DNC, ultimately that was Fusion GPS. Walk us through you know, some of that, that, that timeline of, of some of that, that garbage that these so-called Republicans were putting out. Right, and I think that it's important, and I, I put the timeline together in my book, is that the disinformation campaign, the first outlet who hired Fusion GPS was um, Washington Free Beacon. That is run, was run at the time by Bill Kristol's son-in-law, um, who was never Trumper. He's kind of come around, but they hired Fusion at the end of 2015. Fusion at the time was already putting together dirt on Donald Trump. Um, Glenn Simpson writes about it in his book. So Bill Kristol connected Glenn Simpson with Washington Free Beacon. That was the outlet that published the first article hit piece on Carter Page back in March of 2016. This was in within two days of the Washington Post naming Carter as part of Trump's foreign policy team. Then right. it continued to through all the never Trump um, and, 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 st and, and stop right there, Julie, just a second. I think that's an important point because you know I've been in Republican politics my whole life. No offense to Carter Page, but I'd never heard of Carter Page. Um, and the fact that, you know, Donald Trump talked about him, you know, his name surfaces with about 25 others uh, when Donald Trump just puts out a list. You know, when somebody goes into a campaign, I've been involved with many of them going back, and I'm sure you have too. You know, a candidate's running for office and you say, hey, I want to be on the national security team, <laughs> right? And so it, it's just it's just a list, right? Or I want to be on, you know, farmers for, for whatever candidate it is. You know, every campaign Every candidate puts these groups together and it's made up of volunteers. So, you know, he walks into the, the Donald Trump walks into the Washington Post editorial meeting. This is how this really begins. And, he, and they say, oh, who, who are your national security advisors? Well, he probably just called his campaign and said, hey, who are the people that signed up to be na uh, national security advisors? So he gets a list. I, I think it was 25 people. I, I don't remember the, the exact number. You probably know the whole list. He hands it over to him. Well, then at that point, someone, uh, Julie, and I assume it's, we assume it's Fusion GPS, goes in and looks for the weakest links. And they decide to take the weakest links. And of course, Carter Page is, uh, is, is a weak link because Carter Page had lived in Russia. And no offense you know, to Carter Page, but you know, it's not exact, you know, nobody exactly knows, knows who he is. Nobody's really worked with him. Uh, from what I can tell, he hasn't really been around mainstream Republican politics for a very long time, for a long time. So, I tell that part of the story from my perspective, Julie, because what you just said about Carter Page popping up in a, in a Never Trump outlet, and then a couple of days later showing up in a in in the Washington Post, is really bizarre. It's like, where does that name possibly come from? Who went and did all the research on Carter Page? You know, just kind of an obscure 
uh, an American citizen that likes being a Republican that happened to live in, in, in Russia. Well, and that's important, Congressman, because what happened was the Washington Post published, published that list. Now, it's important to remember that the entirety of the national security foreign policy establishment in Washington, D.C. had already denounced any support for Donald Trump. So all the Bush administration people, all the McCain people, all the Beltway types who populate that space were writing letters denouncing, saying Trump would be a threat to national security, jeopardize global security, et cetera. So he really, I mean, again, no offense to Carter. I love Carter, but, you know, Trump was putting together whatever team he possibly could. And so it was right. within days then this whole, but, but the point is really that this is how this operation began, seeded by Fusion GPS, paid for, connected, orchestrated by never Trumpers like Bill Crystal. Articles, hit pieces in the National Review, hit pieces in the Weekly Standard. Um, and really it all came together that last week of July, as you know, when, is when Fusion and the DNC yeah. put in July of seeding. That's right. July of 2016, I just yes. just for our, our viewers and listeners, I want to make sure that they understand that. So, and what, so go what ahead. was and happening? Right. Yeah, so that's what was happening there? That's when the FBI, that's when the FBI is, launches their investigation. And why did they come up with that operation? Well, we know, and if you look back, and this is where the Never Trumpers helped, especially the Weekly Standard, um, because Robbie Mook and the DNC and the Clinton campaign were so worried about the fallout from the email hacks and those emails that were being released, obviously what happened to Debbie Wasserman Schultz that week. So they very quickly uh, pivoted to the collusion hoax. And that's really, as you know better than I do, the birth of it. Um, but it continued after that. And so the Never Trumpers continued to see the Fusion GPS propaganda after the election, which is something I find particularly shameful is former Senator, the late Senator John McCain's involvement, his staffer, David Kramer, who met with Glenn Simpson, who he knew he was getting political opposition research from. Because according to Glenn Simpson's book, Glenn Simpson and David Kramer had a relationship going over 10 years. So Kramer knew who Glenn Simpson was, wasn't like, oh, I've got this material from a former British spy and it's you know totally legit. Kramer knew what he was getting. He gave it to Senator McCain who then gave it to Jim Comey, who, as you know, already had it. Um, right. But John McCain, it's important, aside from the dossier, and I go through this in my book, for two years, he continued to um, perpetuate the Russian collusion lie. He held a hearing with Jim Clapper um, before Inauguration Day, laying out all the, you know, this war on America that Russia declared. He came after you, as you know, he was very opposed to the release of your memo in February 2018, said you were doing Putin's work or some kind of nonsense. So John mm -hmm. McCain's role I detail, and then as soon as John McCain exits the stage, not to be crude, who steps in but Mitt Romney. And so I think for people like me who defended, supported, voted for, donated to people like McCain and Romney, um, their uh, never Trumpism is particularly um, outrageous and I think disloyal the most disloyal yeah and and, and you and you don't come to this you know just like we started with your background uh, you know you, you it seems to me like you know you're not like one of these real ideological uh people you know you're not you don't get in it doesn't seem to me like you don't get in the arguments between oh well i'm a this type of conservative or i'm a that type or i'm a moderate or i'm a libertarian it seems to me like you're just one of those great Republican women who get out there and you understand, look, I'm not a socialist, I'm not a leftist, I don't believe in these left-wing causes. I believe in the big picture, a big tent Republican party. That's that's kind of what you strike me as. And so I can see how that would really hurt you after you know decades of, of volunteer work, really, right. uh, to see these big picture father figures of the Republican party, the standard bearers of the, of the 08 and 2012 election, to see them come and and just you know pollute and put you know stain all over the Republican Party, I'm sure it just had to had to hurt because I, I know just in my district alone, the Republican women were so upset at all of these you know really father figures of the of the kind of modern day Republican Party, and the, and these are these are not people who are you know who have access to grind or have you know an ideological bent. They're just 
they're Republicans and, and, and they don't want to see people trash their, their party and all the work that they do because there's so many times, and you know this, that, that no matter who the candidate is, Republican women and Republican volunteers, they get out there and bust their, you know what, even though they probably know in the end they're going to lose. And, you know, and I think that was for sure the case with John McCain, like nobody thought that he was going to win, but we went out there and fought the, and fought the fight, right? And, and he was called a, a moron, a racist, a warmonger, he was going to bomb and kill everybody, you know, which is, you know, the irony. And then, of course, you get to Romney and it was kind of the same, the same things. And, you know, and Romney, I think, as we talked about, you know, he had his own problems with his background and that, you know, he had basically flip-flopped on every single position. Um, but you know, a lot of us thought that uh, that we could we could win in 2012. We went we went all out. But I know that's just got to be frustrated. And I think you bring a voice to to all of those Republican volunteers that are out there across the country. And and Julie, you know, and you're able to articulate that uh, in a way coming from the great. You're like a someone involved in the grassroots who has now risen up. I think to be a great investigative journalist because uh, you were one of the few people to call it like you see it coming as a, as a volunteer. And I think that's right. I appreciate your saying that. I mean, my first job in politics was 1993. Shortly after I graduated from college, I went to work for a very conservative Illinois state senator here in the suburbs. And so, you know, that was, you know, the whole Bush era and then, you know, surviving um, the Obama era. But I think, too, as Republican women, especially during the Bush era, I have to say, in McCain's election, you know, we get we get different questions and um, a lot of people asking how we can support Republicans. You know, aren't you for women's rights? Aren't you for, you know, whatever the issue is? And I think especially with the wars, I mean, I, I write about this. Um, the thing I think that gets me the most is how we supported McCain and the Bushes and, and Colin Powell and the, uh, their wars, their foreign wars that we now know for the most part have been failures. Um, and so I remember back in the day, you know, 2005, six, uh, fighting with friends and people who are Democrats. I mean, my husband's a Democrat, and so we know a lot of Democrats, and so we have those kind of heated discussions about defending what they were saying. And now to see them really turn on us um, when we protected them during very, you know, heated times. Um, I think that's what hurts most personally as somebody who got involved in politics, you know, starting in college and, and you, you do, you donate and you develop, you contribute all this time, you're putting out yard signs, you're doing the phone banks, you know, you're registering voters, all the grunt work for these people mm -hmm. who really, um, that's why I call it, it's a betrayal, it's a disloyal opposition and that's really what it is. So I want to make sure that they're never have a position of power in the Republican Party ever again, or conservative movement. Um, and we're seeing them repeat this playbook now, right? So you see Bush, Colin Powell coming out, Carly Fiorina, we're seeing the letters come out. We don't want Donald Trump, we want Joe Biden, he's gonna bring the country together. Um, and now they're being seated with this leftist money. The Lincoln Project is one, uh, another one who's gotten millions of dollars to blast the president. Um, I yeah, and like, and like I said, I, I'm in, I'm in around you know Republican, uh, Republicans you know all over the country and you know, obviously you know all day every day, and uh, I don't know of one Republican who's giving money uh, to you know one prominent Republican who's giving money to to, to any of these groups. So Julie, uh, you know you've been great uh, you know over the last uh, few years, and I want to congratulate you on your new book. But what do you think? Um, in the book, uh, just give kind of the the readers, you know, uh, what was your favorite part of of writing the book? Like, what what part of the research? What 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 was the part that you would, you know, you really enjoyed writing? And and now that the book is is coming out here in the next few days, what would you like the listener or viewer to to know about just something about writing a book? And what was your give us something something on the inside, you know? Well, it was my first book, and so uh, and it was kind of put together by our mutual friend, uh, Victor James Hansen, who I'll always be indebted to for helping put the book together and writing such a nice endorsement of it. Um, the writing part and the research, because I like to do a lot of research, and I think that you have to if you're going to write a book. So anyway, that ended up being the easiest part. <laughs> 
the editing part was actually the one that took the most time. So that I was a little surprised at. If you're planning to write a book or anybody is, um, the editing, which you want somebody to come back and do a really detailed, you know, go through several times. And so um, it's funny, though, since I've gotten the hard copies, I haven't read through it yet. I think I've read a few pages because I'm so afraid I'm going to find something wrong or find a typo or find something that's inaccurate. So uh, but I'm sure other people oh, will. Looking forward to that. And Oh yeah, they'll they'll be there and they'll call it out for sure. Don't don't worry about that. Uh, right, I can right. I can assure you, some somebody will find it. I, I get it all the time, oh, uh, yeah. which which is but it, which is great. It shows that people are are reading uh, reading what you what you write or what you and following what you do or say. So um, as you probably know, we don't Google on this podcast. Uh, we don't use Twitter on this podcast, and we don't use Facebook or 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 Instagram, or at least we don't talk about it. We have to. We have to stay on those platforms to at least get some ideas out. We have no choice, even if they are um, uh, watching what we say and shadow banning us as conservatives and uh, like they've been doing for many, many years. But with all that said, uh, people want to follow you. I know you're on Parlor. You're one of the first people on Parlor. So what, where can they find you? What's your what's your new Parlor handle, Julie? What is my Parlor handle? I think it's just Julie Kelly because my Twitter one was a little bit more complicated because there was already Julie Kelly. So uh, Parlor, I think, is just at Julie Kelly. J -U -L -E. And we'll put it up on, and we'll put it, yeah, I think I think it is, and we'll put it up on the screen. All right. But uh, we'll and put I it up on the screen. An excerpt. So we have an excerpt of the book that was posted on American Greatness um, this, uh, yesterday, and it's my favorite chapter, which is chapter five, Weapons of Mass Collusion, which goes through all of uh, their their handling of the uh, Russia collusion hoax and Mueller probe. So I'm sure you like and that's that. on American, American, that's, that's aggreatness.com. We'll put that on the screen too, the, during the, you know, when we go to produce this okay. and we'll get it up. So, okay. well, Julie, con congratulations. Thank you so much uh, for all the work you've done. Uh, and I think uh, Republicans and conservatives will, they'll, they'll learn a lot uh, in this, uh, in this book. I bet you'll learn some things that you, that you didn't know. And it's always important to follow the money. So with that, this is, this is Devin Nunes. Thank you, Julie Kelly, and we'll catch you on Friday. Thanks for listening to the Devin Nunes Podcast. We invite you to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And remember, you can download this podcast on iTunes or at DevinNunes.com. Storm clouds been gathering so long, I don't know. The darkness around us leaves no easy road. We started wondering if every road dead ends our dream. Whips of dust up and rain's pouring down. Good people struggling in every hometown. We've started wondering if we even matter at all. We'll take that hard road to happier days. Cause we kept our American faith. First trial by fire like this. It's nothing hard working family can fix. We've got the power to save it all here in our hands. We'll take that hard road to happier days. Cause we kept our American faith. We're already half the way there We'll take that hard road to happier days Cause we kept our American faith
paid for by Devin Nunes Campaign Committee.